Um, I should mention that this, uh, this talk is based uh, on research I conducted uh, for my first book, which was looking at the confluence of various anarchisms in the United States uh, during World War I. And, uh, and it really is a global story because there are so many people who were fleeing from Europe to the United States to escape the cataclysm of the war. And there are also people like Ananda Kumaraswamy who arrived too. Um, you know, via England, as we'll see. So first I'd like to begin by thanking the symposium's organizers for inviting me to, to participate in this event, and um, it's, it's been a pleasure. The anarchist dimensions of Kumaraswamy's politics are multifaceted and revolve around three issues, anti-colonialism, post-industrialism, and aesthetics. Today I'm going to be tracing these issues chronologically as they figure in his activities before and during World War I. I think it's fair to say that Kumaraswamy's first wife, Ethel Partridge, played the key role in his early political development. Ethel was a trained weaver, very talented weaver, and deeply committed to the English arts and crafts movement founded by William Morris, who we've uh, heard, you know, Morris's name has been evoked already in the first sessions. As we know, Morris was a socialist who critiqued working class impoverishment and also the inferior quality of industrial goods, as well as the harm that industry did to the environment. Artisan modes of production and the socialization of property were his solution to these uh, issues, and he promoted this program until his death in 1896. From its inception, the arts and crafts movement drew support from a wide range of reformers, but by the early 20th century, it had fragmented with radicals supporting Morris's politics, while others jettisoned anti-capitalism. Ethel Partridge fell on the radical side of this ledger. Um, her brother was part of the Arts and Crafts Guild, founded by the architect C.R. Ashby in 1888. The same year that the Kumaraswamy sailed for Sri Lanka in 1902, the Guild relocated from London to the village of Chipping Campton. This move was inspired by Edward Carpenter, an anarchist who called on workers to adopt a cooperative, rural-based, self-sufficient, lifestyle. Ashby and Carpenter were very close, and Carpenter's ideas played a central role in Ashby's project from its inception. Accordingly, the Guild was organized as a cooperative enterprise with educational programs and an emphasis on comradeship between its members. Relocating to the countryside where workers could reacquaint themselves with Mother Earth, as Ashby put it, completed the, the uh, vision. Well in Sri Lanka, the Kumaraswamis commissioned Ashby to restore a building near Chipping Canton, and this is where they settled when they returned to England in 1907. They also bought shares in Ashby's guild and installed this printing press once owned by Morris in their home. Kumaraswamy's earliest publications are produced on this press. After two years, he returned to Sri Lanka, and from that time forward, he was constantly traveling, traveling back and forth between uh, India and Britain. So, his political activism, activism, it dates to 1905 when he helps found the Ceylon Social Reform Society to promote the values of the emerging Swadeshi movement. Swadeshi activism. It's an agitating for Indian independence on two fronts, boycotting English industrial imports and nurturing Indian-based traditions of manufacture. Kumaraswamy argued that India's Swadeshi depended on the renewal of indigenous arts and the spiritual idealism that shaped the subcontinent's pre-colonial social order. This is a point he underlines in his foreword to medieval Sinhalese art. Uh, that book, was written in his English residence and printed on the press housed in his home. 
It bears the marks of politics literally in its impress as well as its argument. As we've seen, Kumaraswamy described how working under a corporate structure akin to medieval Europe's, artisans produced art that was regarded by nobility and peasants alike as integral to their way of life. Craftsmen were intent not on expressing the external forms of nature, to use Kumaraswamy's phrase, but rather, quote, the idea behind sensuous experience, end of quote, a concept central to Indian religiosity. Out of this effort, had grown a body of traditions, and I quote, molded imperceptibly by successive generations. Under British rule, however, industrial capitalism was undermining the modes of production that tied this art to India's economic life. Colonialism had disrupted society's sponsorship of the artisan. Worse still, machine-made, mass-produced goods were introduced to India. As imported goods flooded into the country, each craft's demise entailed the death of another sphere of the community's means of culture, according to Kumaraswamy. At the same time, the British were introducing academic classicism to colonial art academies and neglecting Indian religions and languages and institutions of higher learning. Thus, they compounded the damage wrought by economic assault with a cultural program of uplift that Kumaraswamy bitterly denounced. In the deeper meaning of the struggle, which he printed in 1907 at Chipping Canton, Kumaraswamy conducted a heated polemic against Indian nationalists who argued industrial capitalism and the European political and cultural practices associated with it were paths to decolonization. Those who pursued the wrong Swadeshi, as he put it, rejected their own culture and stood indifferently, indifferently by while craft traditions died out. In 1914, Kumaraswamy coined the term post-industrialism to characterize his program. He used this concept to attack European and non-European modernizers who divided the world into the advanced and backward and fetishized the Western industrial capitalist experience as the most advanced stage. To speak of post-industrialism was to assert his artisan-based alternative was an imminent form of modernity, not only in competition with industrial capitalism, but perhaps capable of su superseding it. In Britain, Kumaraswamy's prognosis was enthusiastically supported by a number of radicals, notably C.R. Ashby and the Catholic anarchist Arthur J. Penty, who became a collaborator. Penty promoted a decentralized economic system in which federations of community-run guilds would replace the state. In the future guild-based order, factory workers could tr be transformed into artisans and the tyranny of machine-based production would be brought to heel. Kumaraswamy also had a lasting impact on the sculptor Eric Gill, who shared Penty's vision of a guild society as well as his Catholicism. Gill's preface for Vish Vishvakarma, Kumaraswamy's 1914 anthology of Indian sculpture, praised the subcontinent's craft traditions in much the same terms as his mentor, condemning parliamentary politics and industrial capitalism. Gill would devote the rest of his life to, promote, to promoting guild-based anarchism. In sum, while he agitated for a post-industrial revolution in the East, Kumaraswamy and his allies were calling for a parallel revolt in the West. This is the message he propagated up to 1917 when he was banished from the empire for opposing India's participation in World War I. Kumaraswamy relocated to America where the center of his New York life was the Sunwise Turn bookstore. Here he befriended, befriended Mary Mowbray Clark and her sculpture husband, John. Founded in 1916, the Sunwise Turn was a cultural center with a mission. Carl Zagrosser, editor of the anarchist modern school journal, described it as, quote, more than just a bookstore, it was a meeting place for free spirits. 
Harold Loeb, who was involved in the store's publishing efforts, is more specific regarding the politics of its owners and their friends, including Kamara Swamy. He recalled they opposed World War I, were anti-capitalist, and favored the, quote, freedom and beauty of an anarchist society. In late 1917, Kamara Swamy gave a lecture at the Sunwise Turn on Young India with the grocer in attendance. Shortly afterwards, the grocer wrote to Kamara Swamy asking if he could publish the talk in the modern school. Kamara Swamy quickly agreed, advising him to secure permission from Mary Mowbray Clark because the essay was forthcoming in a volume to be published by the Sunwise Turn. He was referring to the dance of Shiva. Young India was followed by a flurry of contributions. Kamara Swamy wrote on Walt Whitman. He contributed a poem entitled New England Woods, reprinted an essay on guild education in India, and gave the grocer permission to reprint the Dance of Shiva's closing chapter, Individuality, Autonomy, and Function. Individuality, Autonomy, and Function codified the anarchist foundations of Kumaraswamy's post-industrial social theory. The title refers to three principles for achieving enlightenment, self-becoming, self-rule, and self-realization through appropriate action. Here, Kamara Swami was signaling his anarchism arose in the first instance from his own cultural heritage. He opened observing, quote, the object of government is to make the governed behave as the governors wish. The repudiation of such tyranny, therefore, necessitated the rejection of all forms of governing in favor of the anarchist ideal, quote, individual autonomy. So there were two options. One was to reorder society so as to maximize the desires of the individual. In this arrangement, people would only cooperate if each agreed to submit to majority decisions. Kumaraswamy, however, had no faith in such a system. The flaw of majority rule anarchism was that everyone remained focused on their own self-aggrandizement. The resulting, quote, anarchy of chaos would lead to a, quote, unstable social equilibrium that could only be righted by some return to a government-based authority. The alternative approach was self-fulfillment through, quote, renunciation a repudiation of the will to govern, end of quote. If this ethos was adopted, there was nothing to prevent the recognition of common interests or the cooperation needed to achieve a harmonious society. Alert to the fact that some readers might construe this call for state socialism, Kumaraswamy added that, quote, cooperation is not government. A reiteration of the principal theme of Peter Kropotkin's 1887 manifesto, Anarchist Communism. Drawing on Kropotkin, Kumaraswamy argued that the ethos of renunciation encouraged the growth of, quote, mutual aid, and allowed each indi individual to fulfill his own function. He called this form of social organizing a, quote, spontaneous anarchy of renunciation. Spontaneous anarchism eliminated the desire for individuals to rule over each other, thus creating a stable equilibrium that could bring an end to social strife and discord. Infused by, quote, unending love and unending liberty, the society of spontaneous anarchism would realize, quote, the greatest degree of freedom and justice practically possible. Kumaraswamy referred to the consciousness of the renunciating anarchist as a will to power which sought only to govern itself. A second essay from the Dance of Shiva, The Cosmopolitan View of Nietzsche, developed this theme. Here, Kumaraswamy brought Indian religiosity, anarchism, and the philosophy of Frederick Nietzsche together in a bid to globalize the post-industrial struggle. Kumaraswamy characterized Nietzsche's philosophy, embodied in his conception of the transcendent individual or superman as, and I quote, the religion of modern Europe, the religion of idealistic individualism. Nietzsche's superman, he wrote, 
realized the unity and interdependence of all life and the interpenetration of the spiritual and the material. This is why Nietzsche was so hostile towards Christianity. Christians cleaved the sacred off from the secular and divided the world into polar opposites of good and evil. Nietzsche's Superman, on the other hand, lived a life of virtue beyond good and evil. He was the Western equivalent of the Javan Mukta freed in this life, quote, whose actions are no longer good or bad, but proceed from his freed nature. Given Nietzsche's status in the anarchist movement, Kumaraswamy's interpretation was bound to resonate. His absolute form of monism fit hand in glove with the renunciation of power over others that was the cornerstone of an anarchist social order. As such, Kumaraswamy represents a compelling instance of porous intermingling in which a European critique of industrial capitalism founded on the arts and crafts was turned to anti-colonial ends in a campaign against Eurocentric cultural imperialism and its material corollary industrial capitalism. Kumaraswamy's renunciating ethos, which would resolve social conflict in favor of the bestowing virtue of the Superman, was inseparable from his post-industrial economic order. This was an eminently anarchist project, not only for India, but for the West as well. Indicative of this perspective, in 1919, the Sunwise Turn published a sociological study, The Intellectuals and the Wage Earners, which predicted a global working class revolution against capitalism and presented Kumaraswamy's anarchism as the revolution's final goal. Of course, Kumaraswamy's publications in the Modern School Journal were an, another avenue for promoting his program. Certainly, they left an impression on the Modern School's editor, Carl Zagrosser, who wrote about Kumaraswamy developing a new internationalism. They also shaped the views of the journal's leading illustrator, Rockwell Kent. In 1918, Kent would leave New York for Alaska to get away from the pro-war atmosphere after the United States joined the war in April 1917, and to live free of government, as he put it. In Alaska, he immersed himself in the dance of Shiva and wrote letters to Carl Zagrosser outlining his, his efforts to achieve idealistic individualism. Kent created a series of drawings and paintings inspired by Kumaraswamy's interpretation of Nietzsche as the herald of the West's dawning transformation, including a lost work entitled The Superman. Upon returning to New York, he transformed excerpts from his diary and letters into an illustrated book, Wilderness, which brought him great acclaim. Having traced Kumaraswamy's impact on American anarchists during World War I, I'll now turn to his critique of British modernists Clive Bell and Roger Fry, who codified their vision in a series of exhibitions in Bell's influential book, Art. Art was regarded by many as the definitive statement on modernism. It, was also, it also had an anarchist valence that once in America, Kumaraswamy felt compelled to respond to. Claude Bell's book, Art, is an exegesis on significant form, his term, which he associates with, quote, the spiritual view of life. Subject matter is secondary to formal elements, which communicates art's emotional significance. To appreciate a work of art, Bell wrote, we need bring with us nothing more than a sense of form and color and knowledge of three-dimensional space. In doing so, one would encounter, quote, pure form, a reality or thing in itself, end of quote, conjured up from the artist's imagination. 
Bell narrates the history of art through this lens on a global scale, claiming that primitive, early Christian, Romanesque, and contemporary post-impressionist artists such as Van Gogh and Paul Gauguin shared the same goal, namely, quote, a passionate desire to express their sense of form. Wherever this quest was displaced by a desire to depict the world realistically or tell a story, art declined. On this basis, Bell dismissed Italian Renaissance classicism and all that followed in its wake. Only the advent of post-impressionist art had reversed the process. When Bell and Fry show showcased their thesis in London, critics accused them of cultural anarchism, claiming post-impressionism was, quote, the analog of the anarchical movement in the political world, the aim being to reduce all institutions to chaos. Rising to the defense, Roger Fry welcomed the analogy. Post-impressionists such as Henri Matisse were, quote, cutting away the merely representative element in art, but this was an intensely constructive effort analogous to the anarchist's social program. Clive Bell seconded this point in art, where he described post-impressionism as, quote, anarchical, because it insists so emphatically on fundamentals and challenges so violently the conventional tradition of art and by implication, the conventional view of life, end of quote. But drawing parallels with anarchism's program for reconstructing society only begged the question as to what modern art's role in society was. According to Clive Bell, post-impressionism, quote, like all sound revolutions, was, quote, nothing more than a return to first principles. This evoked the idea of a cyclical event in which art periodically returned to a fixed point after a lengthy absence, like a planet revolving around a star. But an anarchist revolution is neither cyclical nor celestial. Writing in 1905, Kropotkin characterized revolution as, quote, a period of accelerated evolution when society experiences rapid change in its political, economic, and social structures. An anarchist revolution would destroy repressive social institutions such as state power and capitalist economics, along with other cultural forces that thwarted our freedom. Bell and Fry, on the other hand, sealed anarchism off from this progressive political project. A pronounced elitism undergirds their view, which turns out to be decidedly rarefied. Clive Bell had little faith uh, that more than a tiny fraction of humanity at any given time could ever create or appreciate significant form. In similar vein, Roger Fry wrote that the new movement, that is post-impressionism, was moving into a sphere more and more remote from that of the ordinary man. In proportion as art becomes pure, he continued, the number of people to whom it appeals gets less. That is why, paradoxically, the modern, quote, revolution in art seems to be all out of proportion to any corresponding change in life as a whole. In short, Clive Bell and Roger Fry posited freedom in the social realm as a negative freedom. The only good thing society can do for the artist, wrote Clive Bell, is to leave him alone. The more completely the artist is freed from the pressure of public taste or popular consideration, the better for him and the better for art. Such views were obviously untenable from Kumaraswamy's perspective. As we've seen, Kumaraswamy argued the West was on the cusp of a revolution against industrial capitalism. The task, therefore, was to locate an idealistic impulse among Western artists similar to the idealism that uh, had inspired Indian art. Like Fry and Bell, Kumaraswamy was also configuring Western modernism in an intercultural matrix of affinities. However, his purpose was markedly different. Kumaraswamy was formulating a role for this art within a post-industrial -re revolution that hopefully would span a range of cultures. 
For example, in an article published in the Modern Review in May 1915, Kamara Swami wrote that Van Gogh shared the insights of William Blake, Walt Whitman, and Nietzsche, the visionary troika that prefigured the West's, quote, new religion of idealistic individualism. In 1916, he went further, writing on Rajput painting and its artistic sisterhood to modern art. Kumar Swami argued, quote, Rajput painting is quite akin to modernist art in its purely expressionist intention. Precisely as the subject matter of Rajput painting has no place outside the heart of man, so it is with European, American, and modernist art. Modern art was, quote, metaphysical and saturated with ideas. Its artists concentrated their, quote, energy upon a single passion rather than representing the world accurately. In a second article for Vanity Fair, and this is a New York-based uh, magazine, widely read, published in September 1916, Kumar Swami was more specific. Here he lauded Paul Gauguin's paintings for their, quote, real likeness to the great religious art of India's past, in this instance, the cave paintings of Ajanta. Reversing the accusations of conservatives who derided the post-impressionist violent departure from academic values, Kumar Swami argued this art assumes the likeness of revolt only because Western civilization was on the verge of, quote, incipient reconstruction. In the dance of Shiva, Kumar Swami returned to these questions again, noting Bell's praise for artists who expressed spiritual exaltation through pure form, free of unesthetic matters such as associations. He suggested Clive Bell was valorizing the eminence of the absolute in the self. However, he disagreed with Bell's claim that the sole approach to the absolute was through pure form. Art transformed society, and for this purpose, Kumaraswamy argued, any theme proper to the artist will serve, since the absolute is manifest equally in the little and the great, animate and inanimate, good and evil. Compare this position with Roger Fry's assertion that the modernist revolution in art was disconnected from, quote, any corresponding change in life as a whole because artists were moving into a sphere more and more remote from that of the ordinary man, Roger Fry's words. Kumaraswamy posits quite the opposite. He links the revolutionary agenda of modernism to a broader transformative agenda for Western society. Then there are the contrasting capacities for accommodating difference. Clive Bell and Roger Fry anchor East-West affinities to reductive formalist values, while Kumar Swami focuses on the social and economic role of art, in which culturally specific subject matter and the artist's creativity co-mingle to infu infuse a work with meaning. Thus, Kumar Swami could agitate for a post-industrial revolution in India and Britain, equate Paul Gauguin's modernism with Rajput painting, and inspire Rockwell Kent to commemorate idealistic individualism in the guise of a Nietzschean Superman. He could also configure art historically, giving us a rich scholarly legacy. Most importantly for our purposes, Kumar Swami situates art as an agent of political and economic change across many cultures. This is quite the opposite of Clive Bell and Roger Fry, whose hegemonic formalism goes hand in hand with ahistorical elitism, oblivious to social transformation. Likewise, Kumaraswamy's call for post-industrialism on a global scale is very prescient. This was more than a path to social liberation. It was the reconfiguration of our relationship with the planet. As he wrote in the Modern School in 1919, the Western world has sought to achieve the conquest of nature, to bend its forces to the ends for profit. If much has been achieved in this direction, no less has been lost. It is not the, is not the age nearer to the ends of life when he is more concerned to realize a harmony with nature than a conquest of nature. The anthropocentric view is not forever. However, by the time of his death in 1947, Kumaraswamy's post-industrial anarchism 
is all but forgotten. It represents the road not taken, bypassed after World War I by the capitalist West, the Soviet Empire, and Asia's numerous industrializing modernizers. Thank you.